Ryan Cashman, the uh, Yankees senior vice president, general manager, joining us. And Seton just got busted by oh. Brian Cashman. Yes. You guys are the worst. Yeah. Br Brian uh, came in and realized that you'd uh, skipped allegiance here from you. You'd switch from the Yankees to the Red Sox. I think that these are horrible inaccuracies that, and, and fallacies that you guys continue to. What did you call him, Brian? It's not Seton. It's not Seton. It's Satan. Wow. <laughs> Satan O'Connor. Wow. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who think that. <laughs> could you, if you weren't a Yankee employee, could you ever root for the Red Sox? Like when you're done with this job, could you ever see yourself being, or at least appreciating what you see with the Red Sox, going to a Red Sox game as a fan? I grew up a Dodger fan. You know, I'm, oh. I'm from Kentucky, and I was a huge Dodger fan, which made me a Yankee hater as a kid, you know, growing up. Um, but, you know, so, but, you know, I've been bought and paid for. <laughs> <laughs> who, who was your favorite player growing up? Uh, Ron Say. Really? Yeah, the Penguin. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great infield. Any little short guy that uh, <laughs> that had some pop and stuff. Joe Morgan, because Cincinnati was about 81 miles north of me in Lexington, Kentucky, and so... You know, but uh, back then the Dodgers and the Reds were in the same division. Everybody, it was Reds territory. So I went the opposite way and picked the their rival, the Dodgers and stuff. And so I was yeah, a I grew crazy up Dodger a Reds fan. fan in Cincinnati. So big red machine. I was pretty oh, you lucky. grew up in Cincinnati? Yeah. Oh, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, I was pretty lucky. To, but back then I knew that, that Bench and Perez and Morgan and Rose would, would be there the next year. But, you know, if the Reds were, if that team was today, you couldn't keep that. You couldn't afford that team. No, they were amazing. They really were. I still remember Johnny Bench hitting a grand slam against my Dodgers late in the game at Riverfront Stadium, and you know going home in that long drive, angry, upset, and all this, all the above. So were you Steve Garvey? You mm -hmm. had uh, I mean, had the, we had that Russell. infield. We had that infield for eight years, which was I think a record. So it was Garvey, Lopes, Russell, say. Um, I actually got to be bat boy for the Dodgers in spring training. So Tommy Lasorda to this day takes credit for my start in baseball, and uh, you know, so I was a I was a crazy Dodger fan, and. Um, you know, but, you know, baseball fan all of it. But then got the internship with the Yankees, and, you know, uh, and next, you know, I was, all right, Dodgers are my National League team. Yankees but did you think about team. working for the Dodgers? Did you try to work for the Dodgers? Um, it, you know, I actually had an opportunity, you know, uh, previous ownerships and stuff to leave the Yankees to go to the Dodgers and do the same job, and, and uh, you know, I stayed, you know, and so I stayed at loyalty because George Steimer gave me the opportunity as an intern, and, and I worked my way up the ladder, and the only reason I am whatever I am is because of him and giving me the opportunity. You know, he offered me the GM job, which I wasn't expecting. I was never trying to be. I was the assistant GM for six years. I'd been with the Yankees since 86 before 98 hit. And, uh, and you know, he – you know, he took a liking to me and, and you know, uh, I guess guided me. I was a graduate of George Steinberg University in the end, and, and out of loyalty, I stayed. So, Your pr what, What's the proudest moment of being a GM of the Yankees? Uh, delivering a world championship. I mean, the best time people ask, what's that the best thing? That first one? Any of them. Um, you know, the bottom line is, you know, I, I get that question. What's the, what's the best part of being the GM of the Yankees? You say winning. What's the worst part? It's losing. It's the, that's the truth. I mean, when, you're, when things aren't going the way you want, uh, you know, it's tough. And, and, and when things are, you know, come to completion, when you have a game plan and they execute it, and you know, I've got five World Series titles, uh, four as GM, one as an assistant GM under Bob Watson. Um, I mean, it's just nothing like it. And that Canyon of Heroes and everything that comes with it. But, you know, in the front office, it doesn't last long because, you know, next thing you know, you're off on a flight to the GM meetings and the winter meetings, and you're trying to either put the team together, or keep it together, or make it better. And, Everybody else is getting better at the same time, so it's it's just that constant challenge. The reaction to fans when you're not going doing well. Uh, what do they say to you? Uh, yeah, I don't know if they say it to me. Social media is pretty ugly, you know. I can you know? Are you on social media? No, no, no. <laughs> That's I, a good I, thing. <laughs> but but I certainly see you know uh, you know what. Uh, do you have what, people tell you that? You know, actually, you know, the thing that I uh, I get a lot, which, you know, they're being really nice, but it's like a backhanded slap. Like, I don't care what em what everybody says. <laughs> I think you're doing a great job. And I, I, I get that so much that it's, it's on my, you know, I pose for the picture or sign the autograph or whatever. And they're like, man, I don't care what anybody says. I, I think you're, or what everybody's saying. I think you're doing a great <laughs> job. And I'm like, wow, what, what? So right away, you know, what's everybody saying? You know, so, you know, the Yankee G GM job is interesting because when you win, it's because you got the money. And when you lose, you, how can you mess up with all that money? And uh, but, uh, you know, if it was that easy, the Yankees would have 100 championships. But so. how important is this? Because we all have an ego that and, and I said this, you could be the GM of the year with with what I mean, you made some risky moves. You brought some kids up. It sort of worked out 
I don't know if it's worked out better than you uh, thought, but you don't. You're never going to get the credit. You're you're going to get criticized, but I don't know if you'll ever get the credit. And we were talking about this last week. I said you're developing. You're a Hall of Fame general manager. I mean, you're you're getting into you know that rarefied air. Bob Housen was there. Pat Gillick. You know some great great front office people. And I'm not saying it because you hear because I said it last week. Is that enough for you? You don't have to be recognized, patted on the back. You probably get, have your critics, other GMs. Hey, you got money, you got a payroll. Um, so how do you respond to that? You know, I, I was conditioned in the George Steinbrenner world. That's why I, I joked about it being a graduate of George Steinbrenner Uni- University. And, and the way he ran things, no one was allowed, you know, to even have an ego other than himself. And, <laughs> yeah. and We had enough for everybody. Yeah, so anytime it started, anybody, you know, even when Joe, you know, Joe Torre is great in the Hall of Famer that he is, you know, George started to resent over time all the accolades coming his way. And and so it was almost like the, the smart play was to learn and condition yourself to if things go great, you throw the BKs everywhere else and deflect anything that might come your way because if if too much comes your way, then you're now putting yourself in the spotlight to to not last very long. But did that lead to the breakup of Tory and Steinbrenner ultimately? I, I think so. Ego. I, def- well, I don't know. If I was, I'm not saying Joe had an ego. I, you know, as much as I think there well, was. Well, no, George yeah, realizing. I think, I think there was like anything else. It's there's only uh, the boss was you know the greatest of all time at what he did and how he did it and what he built and how he added to it uh, and uh, but again, you know he. He was an owner, and everybody else was the employee, and everybody had to stay in their lanes and be in their places. And if anybody became bigger than, you know, uh, maybe him or the brand, you know, then there was going to be a rectifying situation eventually would occur. And I think that obviously in the end, because every contract Tory negotiated with Steinbrenner was direct from Joe and George. Uh, so many of the deals worked out, and the last one didn't. And, uh, you know, he was offered a one-year deal by the boss, uh, and it didn't work out. And, you wow. know, and, and uh, but I think it was one of those situations I think Joe describes to, even to this day is I don't think anybody at that time knew how to say goodbye, you know. So, but, uh, yeah, I do think that there was some jealousy and all that other stuff. And I think that's that's not abnormal for when you're an alpha dog and you're, you know, you know, the boss is a Hall of Famer, even though he's not there yet. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. You got a Joe, a Hall of Famer. The you know, alpha dogs, and you know, eventually something gives. What did you think of uh, Larry, Larry David, in with the uh, Seinfeld impersonation of Steinbrenner? I, I mean, he had actually some coaching from behind the scenes. Uh, we had a, we had somebody who was on staff at the time. Apparently, was giving. You know, some behind the scenes. Did Steinbrenner know this? No, <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Oh, it but wasn't. I, okay. No, but I do remember. I do remember he had a chance to play himself on that show before it was the greatest sitcom in history, and uh, I remember the facts coming through uh, to my office. I had to del- deliver it over to legal counsel, and you know, it was you know a suggestion of him. Here's a show. Here's what we're gonna do, and you can play yourself and. And he turned it down. And then later on, I'm sure he was like, wow, you know, because that thing grew into something spectacular. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I get, you know, I get every now and then still to this day, uh, you know, uh, you know, what's the, the, the bald guy with the glasses, uh, uh, escapes my name on the show, you know, uh, the short guy. George Costanza? Yeah, Costanza. Yeah. Like they, you know, I get the Costanza stuff every now and then because he was the traveling secretary or the assistant to the traveling <laughs> secretary. So I, I've heard that over the years enough. Now, so. do you, do you think that's based on you? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. I wasn't. I wasn't me. I Do wasn't, people think it's based off you? No, but you know they just throw it at me and you know have fun with it. So, uh, when we come back, can you stay? Another Absolutely. Second? Okay. When we come back, I want to know if George Steinbrenner was still running the Yankees, what would he have done with Tim Tebow? And I want your favorite George Steinbrenner story that you'll tell your grandkids. We'll come back with Brian Cashman. You, you're gonna. I give you a little bit of time here, though. Okay. You'll be good. Sure. All right. We'll be back with Brian Cashman. Dodger lover, right up to this. Brian Cashman, the Yankees senior vice president, general manager, joining us uh, in studio. Got some young talent there. They won five in a row, two games back, and uh, no longer a feel-good story. They're actual contenders here. Um, When we went to break, I teased a couple of things. Your favorite Steinbrenner story that you'll tell your grandkids. But let me start with Tebow. The Mets signed Tebow for a minor league uh, deal, $100,000. How serious were the Yankees about Tim Tebow? You know, we sent two scouts and we evaluated it and made a decision not to pursue it. Um, you know, so, you know, we, we didn't do any follow-up on him, but uh, got a lot of respect for the fact, you know, he's a great athlete, clearly. 
And, you know, he's got a dream. And it's hard, you know, in this day and age with all the coverage, you know, and stuff, it's hard to put yourself out there to pursue a dream. So I got great respect for what he's doing. And, you know, I wish him the best of luck. You know, I did, I really focused more on, you know what, I don't know if he's going to get there or not, but I know when he was at Florida and his reputation of work ethic and character is off the charts. So he's someone that you want to surround all your people with, yeah. you know, so that type of energy and effort rubs off. You know, you want to, you know, so I thought about it a little bit that way, um, but I wish him the best of luck. He's, uh, he's obviously, you know, pursuing a dream and, and that's what, you know, this country is all about. Would so. George Steinbrenner have had you sign him? Maybe, you know, I never thought about it until you brought it up, but, uh, but George was quite, he was the big, the biggest showman of all and anything and everything that was, you know, an attention grabber and getter. And, you know, he might've, you know, I, I don't know. He might, you know, especially if he had a relationship with him, you know, because George was such a big college football yeah. fan that he probably would have known Tim, probably would have met him at various, you know, functions and award banquets and this and charity events. And, and if he had a relationship with him, yeah, he might have, uh, you know, said, I don't care what anybody says, this is what you're doing and this is what we're going to do. And and he would have mapped out a strategy and, and, you know, it's possible, I don't know, you know, but I never thought about it. How many times do you think you were almost fired? <sighs> you know, there was quite a few times that, uh, you know, you know, I, Gene Michael was one of my mentors, and he taught me to stand it's up. still and, underrated in Yankee history of what he did. In, in, I don't know. I mean, I think pretty much in our, if you hit you know, it Yankee It feels fans like know. nationally. Well, no. Yeah, I'm sure Yankee fans. But I always felt that Stick was so underrated. Yeah, he, he was, felt like nationally. He was a, an amazing, you know, advisor for the boss, did everything from manage, play, coach, general manage. You know, he did it all, super scout. And so... But anyway, uh, working under him as the assistant GM, you know, for as long as I did, I, I, I saw him go, you know, I got a chance to, because I worked for so many general managers, so with so many managers, uh, because it was a revolving door, because, you know, it was an intense situation, and, uh, and he was as tough as they come to work for. And, you know, Gene Michael showed me that you just got to stand your ground, and he, you know, he said the boss wants that, you know, but I think he was so intimidating, most people wouldn't, they would just, you know, kind of execute whatever he wanted but g michael knocked heads with him and and then when i felt it was appropriate i'd do the same thing and you just didn't know how it would react and you ever get fired for a half hour no he would he but uh but you know he never actually you know uttered any of those words but uh but the only thing he would ever do is when he wanted to do something so it was 98 he wanted me to trade for randy johnson from seattle he want you know cleveland was our big rival that particular year is my first year's gm and he's like, you better do this. You better. He's pressuring the hell out of me to trade for Randy Johnson. <laughs> but our team was so good, I was worried that Randy. I had known Randy, uh, Lou Pinella being a former manager of ours, and I had worked with him. I had always asked Lou when he was managing Seattle. Every time they'd go on the East Coast swing, you know, Randy was supposed to pitch against us, and then it would turn out they'd reshuffle the rotation. He'd pitch the last game in Fenway or the first game in Baltimore. And he'd miss us. So I, it happened year after year. And I finally asked Lou, hey, what's going on with that? He said he doesn't like to pitch at Yankee Stadium. So right away I was like, I'm going to trade for this guy wow. who doesn't want to pitch in New York in Yankee Stadium. And, you know, uh, so at the end of the day, I chose not to. And he, he would take the position of you better be right. And, and, and he wound up going to Houston. You know, and uh, they got, and he was amazing. And yeah. they got knocked out in the first round. And, you know, so we didn't have to deal with them with the Indians. And, you know, the rest was history. We went on and won the World Series that year. But the position George would take would be if I was adversarial against something he wanted, I would say, Gene Michael told me this. Well, all right, I'll do it. If this is what you want, I'm going to make sure everybody knows this is what you want. Yeah, but then he became a Yankee in 105. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what happened? Well, we were desperate. <laughs> <laughs> And, and at the end of the and at the end of the day, you know that '98. I mean, again, you have to evaluate your your team chemistry and everything else. The '98 team had something that was so unique and special that uh, you know you didn't want to mess with that clubhouse too easily. And uh, and I mean, it didn't really seem to have a need uh, where the 2005 team did. Yeah. So uh, so it was just completely different circumstances. So. We were thinking about this when we knew we were going to have you on. And Paul goes, you know, the last time we had Brian in studio, and I said, no. And he goes, well, it wasn't officially in studio. We're at Yankee Stadium. And so it's 04. We're outside your office. We're having Schilling on to talk about Bronson Arroyo and A-Rod and the slap. And Paulie goes and knocks on your door to say, would you, would you like to come down and listen to this? And then you said that you didn't want to be on the air but Paulie goes, you might want to listen to it. So Paulie, then you come down, and then all of a sudden, Shill starts killing A Rod. 
And then I looked at you and I said, do you want to talk? And then you go, and so we went to commercial break and came back. And then you came on talking about that play with Bronson Royal. Yeah. Yeah, Paulie. I actually have a quote that you said. You said, I wonder if Schilling would say the same thing if Trot Nixon did that to help him win a game. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I think we talked about it off air. I, I think my therapist does a great job <laughs> of erasing from my memory bank anything 04 related. So, uh, did I don't you go remember. to therapy for that? No, no. I joke it about it. It didn't get that bad. No, it, it was, you know, it's, it it's things though. I mean, you know what? You, uh, we've had a lot of success, we've had failure, you know, but the one when you lose like that, that, that sticks with you more than the winning. If that makes any sense, yeah. like it's, it's well, some don't enjoy thorn. winning as much as they hate losing. Yeah, like the winning is a relief. It's like, wow, thank God, and you know, it was awesome. It's it spectacular. But when you have a situation like we had there in control, I mean, that whole series, you know, a lot of things happened in it. You know, where I don't, I, you know, we had an opportunity from a decision-making standpoint. You know, I think. You know, Schilling, we never bunted on when he had the bad leg. Uh, they switched catchers uh, because of a situation. I can't remember what, why, but uh, their backup catcher uh, was always the knuckleball receiver. Can't think of his name off the top of my head. So, But for some reason, Veritech winds up catching, yes. um, you know, uh, their knuckleballer. Wakefield. And Wakefield. And that's a fear opportunity because he couldn't do it too well. So we could have, you know, right. been jackrabbits all over the base pass. We chose not to. You know, we lost all the rude with a Liz Franck fracture on a check swing, and that put our backup Tony Clark in the game. And so there's a lot of things that happen that, you know, losers talk about, and we lost the series. And do you, you know, really think Chilling had the bloody sock? I mean, I, I there's no reason not to believe it. You know, I mean, he had surgery and all that stuff. Well, I don't know. It, Satan, Satan O'Connor over there still doesn't buy into that. The uh, alleged bloody, bloody sock. The alleged bloody sock. No, he, uh, and it's not around anymore. It was thrown he in the, threw it the out. laundry. I don't follow the Red Sox lore, especially in 04, so I just, it's, a, <laughs> it's a whole bad memory. Uh, the whole situation was something that, you know, again, we're up three games to none. And, and, and this is, I tell you in sports that, you know, no matter what arena you're in, high school, college, pro, you know, a little bit probably set in at our fault where, you know, that third win of the four-game series that we had, uh, you know, the seven-game series we had, but uh, first to four, we, we we closed out game three in Fenway and crushed them. I don't know, it was 17 yeah. to three or six or something. I mean, it was a blowout. Yeah. And I think maybe, you know, our, I know the Red Sox players were congratulating our players in pregame in game four in the, you know, as they're passing, I, like, hey, tell people hey, man, that. good luck in the World Series. That is true, true, right? Yes, Because I is tell true. people that, and they go, there is no way, Red Sox fans go, there's no way. I said, I saw them and even talked to one of the Yankees who said, they just said, congratulations. Yeah, they're like, dude, good luck in the postseason and, you know, in the World Series and this, that, and the other thing. And it turns out they're doing shots before every <laughs> game as a, you know, you know, I guess rallying cry, whatever it took, it, it happened. The series started to change and things. That's why, you know, things can change in a dime, whether it's the last quarter and you're up and some, you know, you got to close things out and we didn't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for whatever the reasons, but that again, lessons learned, I guess. And hopefully if we're ever in a situation like that, again, we will handle it even better than we did. How good did you think Gary Sanchez was going to be? Uh, well, we thought he was going to be, you know, a middle lineup. He, he projects to be a middle lineup bat with, you know, great defense. So we think he can be an impact, you know, middle of the order bat for a long time. So we, you know, I gave him $3 million. Uh, I think it was back in 2009, which is a record bonus at the time and, and for good reason. And, uh, and he's honored that, you know, as he's grown through the system and he's hungry to be a great player, which there's a lot of people that have talent. But when you match the hunger to be great with the talent, that's where the magic happens. And I think, you know, we have a chance to have a special player in our hands. Your favorite Steinbrenner story? I don't know if it's a favorite or not. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, but, you know, one I would... one I haven't heard? Uh, well, I mean, uh, one uh, I would, I'd throw out there is more of... Uh, he, had a, he had drivers, you know, that he loaned out one day to dignitaries or family or what have you. And somehow, you know, when, when I was low-hanging fruit, I drew a short straw. Kentucky boy in New York City, oh, no. and they're like, you're going to have to drive the boss downtown to get a haircut, and uh, I might have been an intern. What could and, go wrong? And then <laughs> after his haircut on the east side, get him over to Teterboro, and he's going to fly back to Tampa. And so I had a guy in the office, Peter Jameson was our assistant GM at the time, and he and, and it was like, oh, my God, you, you're going to have to drive the boss. Where, you know, where, how are you going to take him? And I was like, well, I'll get him on the FDR and, you know, just 
you dig into the FDR and that's it. And he didn't said, have no, GPS back then. No, no, no. And uh, no cell phones. And yeah, this is a long time ago. And so all of a sudden he goes, I got a quicker way for you. He, so he tells me, get on the dig and go to the Willis <laughs> Avenue Bridge. And, and, and he gives me this whole new way. And so I get in the car, boss gets in the back seat. I get on the Deegan, and, and instead of going straight to the FDR, I start pulling off in the Willis Avenue bridge exit. And he, right away, he says in the back seat, he's like, hey, where are you going? And I said, I got a quicker way. <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay, we'll see. So I take the bridge, and anybody who lives in this area, there's a McDonald's on the corner yes. there to this day. And I make the right, and the bridge is closed, completely shut down. I mean, it's under construction. <laughs> And it's uh, all backed up, and he starts railing at me from the back seat. I mean, as loud and uh, as you could possibly believe, get me the blank out of here, take me to the blank and subway, turn back, get me back to Yankee Stadium, you bank, you bank, you bank. I mean, he's killing, as loud as, I mean, I'm sitting there getting blown up from the front, and try driving under those, I mean, the, the toughest job, I think, I, from what I've, we've all worked for the Yankees, uh, thought was the driver. And there was always a story about a driver leaving a guy, leaving him on the bridge because he would go, you know, and tyrant sometimes, tirade sometimes. So anyway, so I tuned him out. I did the backup, turned around, got back on the dig into the FDR, and then I hit a pothole. This was back during the Dinkins Mary years where there was a whole bunch of potholes, everything, and and uh, and so he's like, "This isn't a blank and tank," you know. He's just <laughs> killing me. The entire drive down to the east side. So I get him. You know, I tuned him out. I didn't engage. I just took the beating, the verbal beating, got him to the Upper East Side. And somebody's like, well, this may be why he respected you. You just still did the job under duress. And and I got him to his place. And then he chose to take a cab to, <laughs> to uh, Teterboro. Teterboro. But uh, I had some self-worth uh, of accomplishment, I guess, because I got him there uh, under tough circumstances. But I didn't, didn't like driving him. I don't know if you have the connections to do this, but maybe Satan O'Connor could be a bat boy for a, a Yankee game. If uh, I mean, is he too old to be a bat boy? Do they allow thirty-eight-year-olds? Yeah, can you? I, I, I mean, he looks like if I make him shave, he's going to look like well, he's that's about true. He'd fifteen. Have, he'd have to. He'd have to shave. I have to shave. Oh, cover yeah, the right. tattoos. Yeah, I got to. I, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I don't even know if I can trust a Red Sox in a Yankee. Oh, wow. Uh, in a Yankee <laughs> uniform. Wow. Brutal. You know, wow. uh, because uh, how do I know what he's going to be doing what with if the he, bats? What if he dedicate? What's he? He just declares his love for the Yankees right now. Uh, we, maybe we can make that happen. I can't Seaton, believe it was ever even a question. Seaton, raise your right hand. This one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a Red Sox tattoo? Wow. <laughs> I think it says Veritech. Hold on. <laughs> get rid of this. It's not, listen, the 04 thing, it's not. That's no, it's actually not. a special date in my life. Not. It's not baseball related, actually. Uh, thanks for coming in, Brian. Thanks we appreciate stories. Great day. And congratulations. Congratulations. It's been a great, great season. Surprising season. Well, maybe it's surprising to us, maybe not to you, but thank you for coming in. He's Brian Cashman, the Yankees Senior Vice President, General Manager, and if he offers to give you a ride, don't take it. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.